uh, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's the first effort from MMMRN uh, about an, like uh, featuring a webinar with like uh, previous alumni and our friends. Uh, it's going to be uh, hosted uh, every first uh, Saturday uh, of every month. Uh, that's the plan that we are doing. Uh, our first speaker today is uh, Khan Mahmoud Rabbi. He was one of the graduates from Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology in Mechanical Engineering. He graduated in 2016. In 2017, he came to University of uh, Central Florida on fellowship. Uh, he has been working, uh, since his undergrad, he has been working on um, mostly on thermal fluid. Um, initially, he used to work on computational uh, modeling. Now he's probably working on a little bit of experiments and uh, modeling as well, uh, as far as I understand. And his, his field of uh, like more specific field is uh, electronic packaging. That's a very interesting field. Uh, if anybody, like interesting application field for thermal fluid. It's very complicated and integrated field. I think he will be able to share uh, very insightful stuffs today, uh, and people will do, <clears throat> people will get to know a little bit more about like it's very, it's a good opportunity for current undergrads to know about what is the state of our, art of the research uh, is going on in US and what they can do, what they're capable of. This is an uh, highlight. Uh, so uh, a little bit more uh, more about uh, <clears throat> uh, Kandrabi is like. Uh, he has published uh, more than eight peer-reviewed pa papers, uh, and he can um, the sightings are always rising. Uh, he has been uh, worked on internship uh, at IPM uh, and uh, ASLM. Uh, so it's a nice experience that he has both industrial and academic experience. He will be able to give you more insights, and we will be asking like first we'll let him present, and then uh, you guys, uh, if you have questions about the presentation or any other stuffs after the presentation is done, you can raise your hand or type in chat box. Uh, we'll let you speak. Uh, right now, you can unmute yourself. Uh, we'll let you unmute. Uh, we'll unmute you and you can ask the questions and uh, interact with the speaker. And feel free to like uh, turn on your video if you can. Like it's not like it's it's, it's not something that we are going to force upon, but it'd be nice because like the speaker might feel a little bit more interactive. Seeing uh, it's not it, it has been like Zoom session over and over again. Don't see people, so some faces probably would be more inspiring for the speaker. So without further ado, I'll uh, let Kandra B to uh, take the stage and share his screen and like go on to the presentation. I uh, hope you guys can uh, see my screen. Um, thanks for the invitation and, uh, and the great introduction and the generous introduction, Vivek, I really appreciate it. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, uh, Multiscale Mechanical Modeling and Research Network. Um, uh, the group uh, from uh, where I actually learned um, thermal fluids and heat and mass transfer and the fundamentals of it back in 2015. So it's always a pleasure to, uh, to come back and uh, talk about my research, um, which is uh, currently we're focusing uh, uh, electronics cooling using pulsating uh, liquid jet impingement process. So um, I'd like to thank the pre current president of MMMRN and uh, vice president, all the board members, the advisory board members for the invitation and uh, letting me uh, talk about my research. So it's, it's always very exciting. So, um, so I work in the Interfacial Transport Lab at UCF. Uh, our main goal is to generate and design fundamental understanding and the solid liquid interfaces, which has ranges of uh, applications, not only uh, in electronics cooling, but also in um, uh, power generation, energy storage, and uh, all this uh, cool stuff. So first, um, I'd like to give you a brief uh, overview, uh, overview about uh, what we are going to learn um, during this webinar, because there are so many questions that arise always uh, in terms of thermal fluids and whether they're, uh, whether and how they're capable of, uh, you know, um, creating a, uh, a new horizon in the in the cooling systems. So, so we'll be talking about. Um, let me, yeah. So these are the questions that we'll be asking to ourselves during this webinar, and we'll be answering to them in all the slides. So, uh, if you have any additional questions in your mind, of course you'll have. So feel free to put that in the chat box, and we can always discuss about that later on in the discussion session. So we'll be talking about why uh, specifically we need liquid cooling systems nowadays and what are the state of the arts as Vivek, Vivek was mentioning in the informal chat. And also uh, why do we need the specifically pulsating jet, um, uh, liquid jets to cool uh, electronic packages and whether they can perform better or uh, what's the metric of it. So 
And do we have any experimental or theoretical evidences? Because other than that, we cannot really come to a conclusive point, right? So, and then I'd like to talk about um, uh, how this particular research can um, help the industries uh, in terms of uh, current uh, standing and also in the future. So, and finally, uh, the, I'd like to give a takeaway message from this webinar that all that in these um, uh, can have. So I really appreciate all that in these who are joining from Bangladesh, US, Canada, and all over the, so uh, it's, it's, it's been, um, thanks for joining. So, um, so let's first introduce um, like where I am actually from, like currently what I'm, uh, where I'm actually doing my graduation, uh, graduate studies. So we call it UCF University of Central Florida. So it's, it's specifically located in the very Southern part of uh, US and UCF is uh, basically at the very heart. Uh, it's just 45 minutes drive to the Atlantic Ocean. So you can always have the fresh air coming in and you can uh, certainly have those environments that uh, not only nurture your um, you know, uh, intellectual abilities but also you can have all these fun activities here. And the coolest part is um, UCF is uh, the number one supplier of graduates. I mean, it's the sixth straight year now that uh, they're providing uh, the aerospace industries uh, to be specific, for example, NASA, Lockheed Martin, Pratt and Whitney, SpaceX. Uh, this, it, UCF has been the number one supplier. So uh, it's been great that uh, we, we are having this glorious opportunity, not only uh, to work for these uh, great companies, but also with collaborate with them so that we can have more uh, control over, over our research. And the UCF is the second largest uh, uh, university in the US in terms of student body. Right now it's 72,000 enrollment, even with the COVID last year. So it's enormous. And uh, the, the way that they uh, uh, you know, uh, create their curriculum and not only their academics, but also research is uh, phenomenal. And we have a very good diverse student body. I mean, you can see it's 56% female, 44% male. So we all have our voices here. So, and in, in terms of doing research, we always have this freedom. So let's first um, uh, talk about uh, uh, jumping to our, to our webinar. We'd like to ask ourselves like, why do we need more cooling? So it's more cooling, no pun intended. It's, it's basically coming from uh, Gordon Moore. Uh, probably you know uh, the name. So, Gordon Moore is basically the co-founder of Intel Corporation. And he predicted that the number of transistors uh, you have in your electronic packages or any electronic systems are basically being doubled in every two years. And uh, so that creates a problem, right? Because I mean, what you have in your, uh, in your cell phone is it's uh, to be specific nine billion transistors now. And uh, so what's the problem because all these transistors and all these nanoscale um, uh, connectors, they actually generate a lot of heat. And why is that? Because, I mean, they, have, they are very good electrical conductors, but when you have these really, really nanoscale films, they start to act like insulators. So they have very good electrical resistance. And when you put current through it, so what happens is uh, when you, you feel the resistance, right? So that's why you create the heat out of it. And the nanoscale definition is you have all these drift motion of the electrons that creates an extra kinetic energy that letters converts into uh, thermal energy, which is basically the heat. And, the, and the, the current standing is right now, I don't know whether you know it, but 45% of the energy that we consume in the IT industries, for example, in data centers, they are basically consumed by the cooling systems. So if you spend $10 billion, you're basically $4.5 billion are being spent in designing cooling systems and maintaining them. So it's a talk of the uh, community now because uh, either if, if, we, if you do not have a very good, um, if uh, very efficient cooling systems, we keep on you know, uh, uh, consuming more energy and spending more and more money. And uh, so, so now, so we, we really need to know that uh, what are the, what are the, uh, uh, so I have already talked about liquid cooling systems and why do we need it? But you must be wondering that why I'm not talking about the air cooling systems, which is the current, current standing for all the, all the industries nowadays, whether you call them a data center, semiconductor manufacturing, automotives, they all are using air cooling now, but they're looking into liquid cooling systems. But 
we need to know why. So the main problem is uh, air has a capability that does not have a very good thermal conductivity, right? So it does not have the capability to, you know, um, uh, to cool down devices. So since you have already seen the current trend, we are, we are rising, right? So in terms of generating a lot of heat from a very uh, small spaces, uh, you tend to what you have when you have really really high amount of heat. What you start to do, you is you start to blow more uh, air, right? So that creates a problem because, as you can see from the uh, the COP, the coefficient of performance value, as as you increase the airflow rate, the COP actually decreases quite a lot. So uh, and on the other hand, when you blow more air on your on your uh, electronic systems that are hot. Now you basically have larger pressure drop across the devices and that pressure drop gets converted into acoustic noise. So that not only gives us like a very good um, understanding about how the air cooling system is currently inefficient and uh, incapable of removing really, really large amount of heat from a very small spaces. So, so now that we have underst understood the, uh, the air cooling uh, why the air cooling is not really um, beneficial now or not, be, not really suitable for the current uh, applications. Uh, we need to know uh, what are the major advancements in the liquid cooling system that has recently been done in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in terms of uh, research environment. So recently um, EPAFL researchers have, uh, have introduced a co-design method. Uh, so that's basically a single silicon chip and they're, they're putting uh, uh, numbers of microchannels in this chip. So it's the same manufacturing process. You do not have to uh, talk about or think about the cooling process later in your, uh, in, in your design. So it's a co-design process where you have the coolant coming in and flowing in from the microchannels, taking the heat out from the silicon chip and, uh, and uh, goes out, right? So it's a major advancement in terms of co-design and uh, and as, as you can also imagine, we are reaching a fundamental packages, specifically 2.5D and 3D in recent times. And, uh, but each of the layers, so they have basically bar different layers of memories, right? And each of the memory, memory layer, layers actually create a lot of heat. So you have to have a cooling system that is um, uh, that can uh, mitigate this particular amount of heat from each of these layers. So uh, Georgia Tech's group are uh, uh, advancing quite a lot in there. And uh, recently UIUC has um, developed a jump, uh, jumping droplet cooling system where you have nanostructure surfaces and passivation layer. So you do not need an external pump. In, instead you have uh, used, uh, you, you, you basically tune um, the, uh, the surface energy and the solid and liquid interface so that droplets can jump, jump from the hot surface and taking the heat out in, the, in, the, uh, in event. Uh, but there's definitely some concerns about um, actual expectations and also the future of it. But um, and other, on, on the other hand, the Stanford's uh, nano heat group, Professor Goodson's lab, they're actually looking into Three-dimensional manifold cooling systems. It's it's also basically a embedded cooling system where you have number of microchannels, but the difference is you have a jet region at the very middle where the you basically have the uh, chip in the bottom. So so the fluid will come in from the manifolds and go into and take a perpendicular turn, and it will be uh, act, uh, it will be impinged on the hot surface and taking the heat out. So these micro packages are all over the uh, uh, place right now in terms of research and they're collaborating with Toyota. So it has a major applications in the automotive industries nowadays. So, so since we have already talked about all these um, uh, cooling systems, uh, liquid cooling systems to be specific, uh, and we need to know why a jet impingement process and specifically pulsating jet impingement process can be an effective uh, uh, technique to mitigate large amount of heat from electronic packages. So the major reason is, um, so when you have a jet impingement has been in the market for a number of years. I mean, uh, it, ha it was first innovated in the 1960s back in NASA where they actually tried to incorporate uh, jet impingement cooling systems in their space shuttles. But 
uh, it was always used for hot spots cooling where you have very targeted hot, hot zones on a particular machine or an uh, electronic device and you do not want that, right? And you really want uniform surface temperature. So for that particular perspective, you jet impeachment coolant has proven its capability. It has the highest of the heat transfer coefficient values if you compare with other cooling systems. But pulsating it makes it more uh, interesting. So when you have free stream jet coming in and taking the heat out from a particular surface, we figured out that uh, not all the droplet from the free stream jet does not have the, uh, does not get the chance to do the phase change. We want uh, the phase change to happen. So by phase change, I'm meaning the, the conversion of phase from liquid to vapor, because in that way we can certainly use the latent heat of vaporization, which is enormous. Uh, but as I mentioned, with a higher flow rate of the free stream conventional jets, you do not have the capability because of the flooding, as I have mentioned. But when you turn down the flow rate, you basically get really, really large dry spots at different locations of the, of the uh, surface. So that, that's not, not also very desirable because it does not, so you basically will see a temperature spike in all those regions. So that's why we come up with a pulsating system, which is essentially a, a intermediate regime of high flow rate and a low flow rate regime. So what we basically do is we can chop off uh, or pulsate the free stream jets into tiny little droplets or segment of liquids so that we have the time scales associated with it so that we have the time so that the droplets can evaporate and we can take the advantage of the later, uh, latent heat of vaporization. So, um, and, uh, so th that's the fundamental, but you must be asking yourself like whether, whether we have any experimental evidence, uh, right? I mean, whether this pulsating jet impingement cooling process can be efficient, whether they're efficient, whether, well, if you compare with other cooling systems, are they better? So to do this, uh, to, to, to get up to this point, we need to come up with a very good experimental test bed uh, that needs to have three different segments. So the first segment is basically the flow loop itself. On the other hand, you need to have a very good heater and which can also be served as a thermal sensor. And lastly, the third segment is basically your diagnostic system where you basically image uh, the temperature information and also the flow dynamics. So in this particular research, we have used um, military grade FLIR thermal imaging camera to capture the pixel by pixel temperature information as the pulsating droplet comes in contact with the heater and takes the heat out. And uh, not only that, we also need to know and see uh, what are the major flow dynamics events? Because we expect that there must be some two phase events like all this boiling and stuff uh, that can happen at the solid liquid interface at really, really high heat fluxes. Um, so this is very essential because since we are targeting to use a uh, thermal imaging camera, we need to design our heater in that way so that it can be tracked down by the IR camera. So that, that so designing and fabricating the heater and sensor, which is placed in the, uh, the chamber is very crucial. We'll be talking about that in the later slide. One important thing that in, in this test bed is uh, you must be wondering how we are creating this pulsating pattern. So we basically introduced a mechanical chopper wheel, which has a bunch of holes in it, micro scale uh, and bulk scale holes in it, um, which is coupled to a DC motor. So by just Rotating the chopper wheel, you basically chopping the free stream jets into tiny little droplets, either or tiny little segment of liquid, so that you do not have free stream coming in and taking the heat out from the. So that's how we create the pulsating uh, events. Uh, now we have to talk about uh, what's the fabrication process of this heater and sensor that I've already uh, already mentioned. So. As engineers, we always, in terms of doing research, uh, what we basically do is um, uh, to, we mimic the systems, right? So uh, we, we want to cool down the system. So we want to create the problem. So uh, that's why we have a device. We need to have a device that can uh, get really, really hot and can mimic an uh, actual electronic package. So uh, to do that, we actually fabricated um, a heater sensor out of titanium um, thin film, 
on a fused silica substrate or glass substrate. So the purpose of behind using this particular substrate is these are very good uh, IR transfer material. And uh, if you put, because the idea of making this heater is uh, we want to put a thin, uh, thin conductive film so that we can run current through it. And since it has a finite electrical resistance, you basically generate a lot of heat because of the current flowing from the joule heating, right? So um, that's why, I mean, uh, we, we deposited very thin film of titanium uh, to be specific 100 nanometers using magnetic scattering technique in our lab. And then we put different masks and um, very highly electrically conductive silver paste so that we can put copper wrap around because at the end of the day, you need to run current through it. But uh, this wrap actually allows us to go on the other side because you want to run the current from the other side because, and because the thing is, since the fused silica is IR transparent, but the titanium, which is coated on the top of the uh, fused silica, is not really IR transparent. So, which is good because the heat transfer surface is here. And you can certainly image the heat transfer process from below. And because you cannot obstruct the flow coming in from this side, uh, as you have seen in the schematic diagram before. So, uh, once you have this heater, we, we put that in our uh, uh, pulsating jet chamber. And uh, while doing that, we, we, we test our flow loop. We run the flow loop. Uh, we fill the flow loop with the appropriate coolant. And to be specific, we are just testing with water now. And we have some plans of using other coolants in the future. But you must be wondering now whether we were able to capture the thermal information using the uh, infrared camera. So what we basically did was um, we captured the temperature. So infrared camera gives us the ability you know, to, 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 to get pixel by pixel temperature information. So there are so many other thermal diagnostic techniques like thermocouples, um, fluorescence microscopy, and all the other spectroscopy, uh, quantum dots, temperature sensitive paints. They have, there, there are a lot of tons of thermal diagnostic technologies out there. But the, uh, the, the uh, best thing about the IR camera is it's essentially like millions of therm thermocouples. So you have the capability uh, you have a very good spatial resolution. And the IR camera that we used has a good frame rate. Uh, it was uh, 800 frames per second. So uh, we can actually capture these pul pulsation events using the IR camera. So it has a very good temporal resolution as well. So in the top two plots, what you basically see is the pulsation. Uh, so, all the, so if you follow the black curve, it's basically the temperature that we received from the IR camera. Um, so the peaks and valleys of the black curve is basically, I think you have already got it. So the peaks are basically where you do not have any liquid on the surface. So that's why you have a certain temperature spike. But the valleys are basically the minimum temperature that you, that you receive. That's basically when you have the next series of droplet or the next segment of droplet coming in, in contact with the heater and taking, up, taking the heat out. And we also took care of the, so we calculated the time it takes to reach to the, from peak to the valley and to the peak. So this time scale is important and we'll be talking about in the, in the later slides. So we can see two different region here. One is the jet impingement zone and one is the radial flow zone. So the jet impingement zone is basically the cone of the jet. So imagine if you have a jet coming in, taking the heat out, there's a very center of the jet where you have the interface that is your jet impingement zone. And people like sometimes call it the stagnation zone where you basically do not have any, any um, net flow. But as it propagates on the surface, it can radially flow, right? So in those uh, radial locations, we have some spreading uh, of the droplet uh, or the pulsating jets. Uh, and we call it the radial flow zones. And we captured the thermal information in all these locations. So uh, now you must be wondering the same thermal and heat transfer map, how are you capturing? Because the IR camera does not give directly the heat transfer coefficient values. Just to give you a sign of the heat transfer coefficient that we talk, uh, we, we, I'm talking about is basically the convective heat transfer coefficient, which comes from the Newton's law of cooling. So when you have, if you want to raise the temperature by one degree Celsius, how much heat from a particular surface, uh, from unit surface area you can actually uh, transfer is basically your convective heat transfer coefficient. 
So once you know the surface temperature from the IR camera, you know the fluid temperature, which is the ambient fluid temperature. And since we are running the current through a particular nanoscale film, we know the amount of current. We, can, we know the resistance, we can calculate the power and we can calculate the heat flux because we know the surface area. Once we plug in these three informations, we see which is the heat flux, the surface temperature from the air camera, the fluid temperature, and plug this information in the Newton's law of cooling, we can actually calculate the heat transfer coefficient values pixel by pixel. So this is very important because, so on the right, uh, thermal and heat transfer coefficient map, you certainly see a non-uniform uh, distribution. That's mainly because the surface was basically in vertical, loca vertical location and the jet was in the horizontal location. So it's basically coming in from, uh, from a parallel to, the, to your ground. Uh, and then it hits on the surface and due to gravity, it flows down. So uh, these unique um, uh, um, uh, thermal informations uh, we have, now we, we need to know, uh, since we have already used the IR camera to capture the important temperature informations, whether, and we can certainly extract the HTC or the heat transfer coefficient values uh, now we need to know whether we were able to capture the flow dynamics uh, of the boiling because if I can go back, you can basically see at the center zone, it's essentially very cool around 70 degrees Celsius, but they're at different radial locations, it more than 100 degrees Celsius. So you can actually expect some form of boiling, not at the center of the jet, but at the radial locations, which is expected. So we, try, we use the high-speed camera to captured all these boiling events. So I'd like to uh, um, have your attention on these inset uh, figures that you have, the zoomed in figures. So different, so the boiling events have four different segments, which is the bubble growth zone, the dry out zones, partial reweighting and fully reweighting. So what happens is as soon as the liquid takes the heat out from the device and it reaches that saturation level of 100 degrees Celsius, it creates this uh, these uh, vapor bubbles. So we have tons of vapor bubbles there and after some times, the vapor bubble collapses and you end up having these dry spots. And when the next series of droplet comes in, these dry spots are uh, mitigated by the uh, coming in liquid. And then you have fully reweighted zones. This is important because the time scales associated with this, which is uh, from the bubble growth zone to the start of reweighting is in the order of 65 to 70 uh, milliseconds. So which is which is very synchronous and aligned with the pulsation that we are creating as well. So since we have already mentioned that we're creating this pulsation to let the droplet evaporate. So we are giving the right amount of time to evaporate so that we can utilize that latent uh, vaporization. We're actually pro uh, providing this information experimentally here. Now, you must be wondering whether these uh, pulsation events can actually enhance the heat transfer process it certainly can because we tested with number of pulsation frequencies and number of heat fluxes. So in lower pulse uh, heat fluxes, you can see up till uh, up to pulsation frequency of 15, we're seeing a rise, but after that, the heat transfer coefficient is basically diminishing. On the other hand, the heat transfer coefficient for higher heat fluxes, for example, 60 watt per centimeter square, it tends to rise. So but the thing is, these particular trend, like increasing and decreasing at a lower heat flux, we can also expect that on the, on the higher heat fluxes, but at a later frequency probably. But this, this remains as a question. So we needed to ask that to ourselves and we needed to think whether we can solve this and uh, answer to this question theoretically. So what we ended up doing was, um, we, uh, since we already know the, how the heat transfer coefficient is scaled with thermal effusivity um, and the pulsation frequency, we can actually calculate that from, uh, from there as well. But uh, you must be wondering about the thermal effusivity, how am I going to calculate these? Because I know the FP values because it's basically your input parameter. So the thermal effusivity to calculate that, we use the instantaneous heat flux matching. So if you have the solid, if you have the liquid, the, at the very interface, the, that particular heat flux, the solid is providing, that right amount of heat flux is taken away by the liquid. So that's why we call it the heat flux matching. And when we do that, 
um, uh, using these equations, we can calculate this effective thermal effusivity. So we can calculate because we know the surface temperature of the solid, we can easily get it from thermocouple. We know the liquid temperature and we know the in, uh, interface temperature, which we can get from the IR camera. Now, once we plug these in on this information uh, on, the, on the top equation, we can get this H max line that you can see on the right plot. But still what you basically see an increasing trend in the pulsation frequency uh, with the pulsation frequency, which is very good that that's the same thing we expected, right? But the problem is we are not really seeing that peak and diminishing characteristics that we experimentally saw. And we are, the magnitude of it is also very uh, different. So the magnitude of this H max is different from the uh, experimental values. The, the main reason is probably we did not, we actually did not consider the radiative losses. So uh, in the model, so if we can do that, we probably has a, uh, we'll have a, a smaller uh, in magnitude heat transfer coefficient values. And also the, um, uh, so yeah, so again, we, this particular prediction method, we were only able to capture the, uh, the, the relationship between the HTC and the pulsation rate frequency, but still we need to go forward and talk about whether there is any optimum pulsation frequency that we are, that we are looking for. So by, by saying optimum pulsation frequency, we're basically looking into at which pulsation frequency will have maximum heat transfer coefficient, right? That's, that's where we, we can call it the optimum pulsation frequency. So this is the equation, it's a well-established equation from, uh, so if we can know the Kapitza number, so Kapitza number is a non-dimensional number that is related to um, flow, I mean, uh, falling film of liquid, which is gravity driven, and if it's heated, in that case, we can use this uh, law to calculate the optimum position frequency. But calculating the Kapitza number is also very crucial. And we can certainly calculate it from other uh, non-dimensional number and the radial, uh, velocity and the wave velocity. I'm not digging deeper into this, but we can always have a chat on, on this in the, in, the, in the discussion section. But I'm just giving you a very high level understanding of how we come up with the optimum criterion. And then if you, if you know the Rayleigh Tyler instability, which is the instability between the liquid and the air, because the liquid is basically coming uh, from an environment which is basically air. So if you know all the thermophysical properties like surface tension and the densities of it, you can calculate the lambda. And if you plug in all this information in the top slides, we can calculate the optimum pulsation frequency. The main reason behind getting this is up, until up, up, I mean, after this point, the inertia forces are less dominant. That's why you do not have that, that lower thermal boundary layer thickness. So, uh, the, uh, after this, you basically have high thermal boundary layer thickness and smaller heat transfer coefficient values. So now that we understood the, the optimum pulsation frequency um, and we kind of know what we are uh, trying to achieve now, we have to talk about uh, how this particular research is going to benefit the industries. For example, in the data centers, they have been trying to retrofit the liquid cooling systems and if they can do it, Using the pulsating mechanism, they are not, uh, they're getting really, really efficient cooling process, but also they're, because of the pulsation, they're saving a lot of, a uh, lot of coolant. And we can come up with better designs, um, uh, building better cooling system designs for power generation systems, for example, turbines. And uh, in automotive sectors, the hybrid automotive um, um, vehicles, not only um, electric vehicles, but also the hybrid ones, they're still using the internal combustion engines where you can actually use the automatic transmission fluid as a coolant to cool down the hot machineries and also the battery packs in the back of the EVs uh, get really, really hot as well. So the pulsating mechanism can also help us out there. On the semiconductor packaging, um, so you basically, we have already talked about it. Um, the semiconductors, they get really, really hot at different locations we call the hot spots. So in terms of mitigating these hot, hot spots and creating a temperature that is very, very uniform and far below the threshold temperature, uh, we can actually deploy this pulse heating cooling technique to, to achieve that. Um, so one takeaway message I really want to give uh, in this webinar, this is basically my concluding slide. We have already talked about all these um, pulse heating mechanism and whether we have the experimental evidence using 
novel diagnostic techniques. Um, at the end of the day, what we are basically talking about is uh, the less is more, which is, again, no pun, it's basically coming from Gordon Moore. So uh, we have lesser amount, right? So you do not need really, really high amount of liquid jet um, to cool down a particular device. You, by just pulsating it, you are basically saving a lot of coolant, you're saving pumping power, and you're saving a lot of money and still getting very, very good efficiency and uh, uh, highly performed uh, heat transfer uh, process. So by just saying that, um, I'd like to um, um, thank, um, uh, let me, yeah. So I'd like to thank my PhD supervisor who actually gave a lot of advice and insightful suggestions uh, throughout the experiments and the theoretical modeling. I'm indebted to all the graduate mentees I've worked with. They all contributed to this project and, um, and the funding support from the National Science Foundation. And uh, of course, the uh, Office of Naval Research and also they've learned the Student Government Association for giving me a number of conference uh, presentation fellowships to convey my uh, research to the community and of course the Office of Research. And uh, we are indebted to uh, the media personnel uh, who took our interviews, who write generous articles about our research uh, that gives us um, more motivation and, uh, and uh, it can be certainly deployable uh, in industrial settings. So we are, uh, the, the writings, uh, the media writers provided are extremely important in this regard and we are really humbled by it. One final thing that I really would like to say, this particular research is going to provide design guidelines to the, to the engineers, scientists all over the world who are working in the academia or industry to design better liquid cooling systems for future generation electronic devices. And by just saying that, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, listening to my talk. It's a little over uh, that uh, designated time, but uh, I, again, uh, very humbled by the invitation from the uh, multi-scale mechanical modeling and research network group. And um, so, yeah, I'd like to conclude here. And if you have any questions, we can certainly talk about this here. And if you, if you do not have right now, you can always reach out to me by, uh, by this email address and I can always come back to you on this. So thank you so much. Okay, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Kanrabi, uh, for this amazing presentation. I think uh, the last time that I had any thermal presentation on electronic schooling was like Yogi Joshi in 2017. I think you, you were referring to his group, yeah. uh, this jet cooling. I, I, I remember that that uh, that topic he was talking about, but I think they use like jet jet cooling is like not like pulsated cooling and two phase flow yeah. is their main 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 game. Yeah, so that was an interesting presentation. I was kind of worried like if it's going to be too overboard for the uh, people who are just studying and regard, but I think it's a nice presentation of like building up from the very basic that what are you going to do, what you have done so far, and what's going on. I, I really like it. I think people would appreciate as something they can relate to. They have studied probably or studying right now some topic rather than something. Oh, that you like it, yeah. Yeah. So I remember like it was like our uh, junior year when we started like thermal right. thermal stops, right? So I think I think they can relate. So they, right. that's interesting. interesting thing. So before going into like audience, I have a one question. I have one question or comment, I would say, like uh, right. if you can go to like slide 11. Right. So let me. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah here. Uh, can, can you go on pictures? Yeah. So uh, you're mentioning that you didn't consider uh, a radiative, uh, radiative, radiative uh, heat transfer here. But the thing is like your heating temperature is around 100 degrees Celsius, like the thermal map that I just saw, uh, 100 yeah. degrees Celsius. So, and um, so the radiation temperature, uh, do you think like because radiation temperature, the coefficient of radiative temperature, like radiative uh, heat transfer is very, very small, right? Uh, so do you think that's like this amount of, like this temperature would like make any difference in radiation? Like um, this amount, is it going to cover that gap that you're having just because of radiation? Um, so here's the thing. Um, it's, a, it's a valid question. So uh, when I talked about the radiation, uh, uh, I think I did not convey that message correctly. So the thing is the emissivity, because the, when you use the IO camera, you need to know the emissivity values of the titanium thin film that we used as a heater. So the problem is the nanoscale film has a very, very low emissivity. That's a problem. 
And these emissivity values is not constant, but we, for our experiment, we assumed it to be constant. That emissivity value, so for titanium, the emissivity is 0 0.45, we assume that. But it can be a function of temperature as well. And if it's a function of temperature and you plug in that, so for example, in the IR camera, if you have a proper, so we assume the emissivity value of 0 0.45, it can be 0 0.3. Right, and if, if it does that, we will see even higher temperatures at different locations. So that will definitely give us more, um, a, a certainly a different value in the heat transfer coefficient. In fact, we'll see a smaller heat transfer coefficient value. But if it's higher, the emissivity values is higher than the, if it's higher than the 0 0.45 value, definitely you will see a lower temperature, surface temperature. So you basically have smaller temperature gradient and higher heat transfer coefficient. So we need, really need to look like, so anybody who is willing to use IR camera, we then really need to come up with a good calibration scheme to actually achieve what is the current emissivity values. So maybe that's one of the reasons. Uh, uh, so it's, it's not, so radiation, the radiative transport in, in essence is not going to influence um, the overall heat transfer performance, but the emissivity of the surface if it, if it is a function of temperature and if we cannot measure it correctly, then uh, we can have this enormous gap in the theoretical because the theoretical map does not really have the emissivity parameter in it, right? So it, it's quite dumb, the theoretical model, right? But the experiment is experiment. So you have all these uh, other assumptions that, that you need to consider. But uh, the, the thing that you mentioned, I'm trying to skip from the slide a little bit so that I can, yeah. So I have, uh, that's a valid point because we actually calculated how much heat is basically uh, getting out from each of the layers. And um, we found out that the, the, the conduction and the convection to the, um, uh, to, uh, the, the water drop that is, in, uh, is really, really low. So when you have really, really low thermal resistances, you basically have higher heat transport, right? So you do not really need to worry about other mechanisms. Um, so, uh, so in all the intermediate layers, because you have titanium and you have heat losses uh, along the plane and normal to the plane, and you basically see that we have really good, um, uh, I would say, uh, heat transfer coefficient, uh, th uh, good uh, reasonable uh, thermal resistance values because they are usually in the order of thousand and several thousands, and we are getting only 3.05 for the water side. So it's enormously small. So that gives us that majority of the heat, I would say 97% of the heat is basically taken, taken away by the liquid itself, but we have this conduction losses into the manifold, of course. Uh, but yes, the radiative does not have any direct influence, but the emissivity that I've mentioned has is a very important thing to consider about. Yeah, okay, that's a nice answer. I was looking because, like, at least uh, uh, my follow up question would be: Did you consider any other mechanism? But you just you just answered that question <laughs> right away, so that was interesting. Uh, okay, so there are some like uh, other people. If you want to ask questions, you can raise your hand. We can give you uh, like we can unmute you and we can ask questions. That would be interactive. But for now, uh, uh, we have a question in the chat box that I will just read out, um, and then I will let him speak if he would like to. So uh, one of the questions that uh, asked by Maruf that uh, he's saying that uh, what kind of uh, like velocity, like what kind of profile of pulsating flow that you consider like when you when you're using that encoder to let the liquid in, like is there any sign, is there any specific shape that you consider like square flow or like uh, sign? Um, yeah, like so yeah, that's a valid question. So we actually uh, um, incorporated the square flow so because it's easier to implement, honestly. Uh, because if we really want to, you know, nurture the flow, you, like you can certainly create sinusoidal, um, all these trigonometric shapes, but the problem is you do not have the finer control over because there is no such a device, not a single device, not even a solenoid valve that can actually give you that. Because there's so many, because the, the, there's so much backflow coming in. If you really want to, uh, you know, create this pulsation right at the tip of the orifice that you have, if you really want to create really, really smart pulsation uh, profile, there's so much backflow coming in into the orifice as well. That's another problem. 
But for now, we are only considering the square shapes and we are achieving that uh, using the mechanical chopper wheel. And um, I think the another part of the question was uh, which flow regime. So I don't know. So yeah, so we are used, we are right now, we are in the laminar flow. The Reynolds number is, is pretty moderate. It's 997. So, but uh, we can always create turbulence regime and, and we can also take that route. But yeah, I think that actually answered, uh, if, it, if it helps, uh, I don't know whether it answers to my question, to the question that you raised. Yeah, uh, so uh, do you have any other follow-up question, Murph, and I can unmute you and you can go ahead and ask. Like you can raise your hand, probably. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, my my question, the point of the question was that uh, if you consider different types of flow, profi flow profile, flow profile in that case, uh, the pumping power will also depend on that, the, pulse, you know, the power that you require for creating the pulsation. So how to justify this kind of uh, flow pattern? Uh, is it based on literature review that a number of results suggest that this will result in a better heat transfer coefficient or is it just because it's easier to produce or is it just because it requires less power to produce or the economical constraints that it overcomes i uh, i just want to know why why is it being chosen okay um uh, i think there are several parts So the main reason, yes, uh, we have performed like a lot of literature reviews and we have performed pulsating jet impingement cooling it has also been, uh, you know, research. Of course, Europe, but the problem was they never actually come up with a theoretical model that justifies that, yes, uh, they always uh, try to say that the heat transfer coefficient is a function of pulsation frequency. So if you increase the pulsation frequency, of course the heat transfer coefficient is going to increase, right? Because if you go, for example, if you go in finite amount of pulsation frequency, that is essentially your free stream jet. For example, the, if the FP value is in finite hertz, that's basically your free stream jet. So you can always go up and up. But in reality, if you really look into the physics of it, there is a fundamental limit. So that's the first thing that, so that's the different thing about our project that, um, it's one of a kind that we are uh, able to capture that optimum pulsation frequency uh, for a, to achieve that high heat transfer coefficient values. I think um, getting this square shaped, um, I, uh, I would say pulsation profile is, uh, is more, uh, uh, not only it more, more justifiable because either you have a droplet, so it's a binary process, right? Either you have a droplet or you do not. There is no in intermediate thing, right? So uh, that's why we have these. It's only thing that you can tune is uh, these the time it takes, you know, uh, to have. So, like, if you really want to design a system or a design a particular pulsating system for a specific cause or application, what you can tune is this T on and T off. Like, what's the time it takes to um, for the liquid uh, to come down and what's the time duration uh, at which you do not have any liquid on. Um, in terms of pumping power, um, it does not really decrease the pumping power because, um, because the, I mean, in terms of uh, energy, energy consumption, but in, in terms of using lesser coolant because the coolant, they have a separate storage box and they have a separate flow circuit and you do not have to use that as well. And the coolest part is um, you can always raise the flow velocity and uh, go really, really high at very, very high Reynolds number and get different uh, optimum pulsation frequency values. But it, again, it will be the more the Reynolds number, the higher the pumping power need, right? So. I would say it is not really uh, decreasing the, the pumping need because uh, there is uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, total energy consumption, but uh, 
what we are basically trying to show here is you do not need that much of that amount of coolant. So you're, because the coolant has to, you know, go into a separate full flowing loop for, for example, a condenser, because it has to, because the fluid gets hot, right? By taking the heat out and it needs to reject that heat to the surrounding. So you are not only uh, helping that secondary flow loop, but also uh, you're creating, we are, you're still getting the, that amount of higher heat transfer coefficient. And in terms of creating, uh, you talked about other profiles. Uh, I think I, I already answered to that question. Uh, it will not be justified to use uh, uh, sinusoidal shapes uh, in terms, if you, if you really need um, either on and off. So it's a binary mechanism, but uh, um, yeah. So, um, but again, uh, one thing I think you have already also touched on in one of your questions, all of this is basically a function of uh, uh, the, 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 the particular material in the surface you're using and for the liquid as well. So the solid liquid combination uh, we have it can actually change the whole game. So because the thermal fluid, because we are looking right at the interface, the surface energy of the surface can actually dictate a lot because there's so many things that I did not touch about. For example, the weighting uh, characteristics of the liquid, like how fast the liquid can weight a surface. And by engineering and learning and developing more and more fundamental knowledge, we'll be able to create um, better profiles, but still I believe it will be square in shape. Okay, anyone else have any question? You can raise your hand and you can go ahead and ask Will that you ask that'll be more interactive to the speaker and we will also get the platform. But it's a very good question. Thank you for that. Yeah, by the time someone else asked the question, I would like to ask one question. So first of all, thank you, Ravi, for your nice presentation. I really enjoyed it. So my question is, did you compare your pulsating heat transfer with some traditional method like say air cooling or say water cooling? So how much efficiency did you achieve? through this process? Yeah, it's a valid point. Um, the problem is um, we did not actually consider, uh, like uh, compare our technologies with the, because it's quite different. I mean, there is no, uh, not as I'd say uniform metric or consistent metrics uh, that we can use, you know, to quantify because we cannot, because jet impingement cooling process, you always, you probably all know that has a very, very high transfer coefficient because you basically have very direct impeachment process there. Mm -hmm. So you're basically shrinking down the thermal boundary layer thickness more and more. That's why you get the heat transfer coefficient. So there is no question about high heat transfer coefficient values in terms of using jet impeachment process. But um, so it will, if you compare it with others, so we did the literature reviews, uh, but I would say, uh, um, but only thing that we can compare with right now is there's some other pulsation flow boiling, uh, uh, microchannel flow boiling experiments that, in, that are being conducted in uh, different labs, uh, uh, research labs and national labs right now. Uh, but we do not have those data published, but it's, it's on the current trend. We have seen some of the ideas in the conference proceedings. So probably in the later uh, year, if, we, if they publish those data, we will certainly be able to uh, compare our pulsating liquid jet with their pulsation, other mechanisms like such as micro scale, uh, micro channel flow boiling or, uh, or pool boiling or pulsation, uh, uh, air cooling and all this stuff. Thank you for your answer. But that's a valid question, right? I mean, I have been asked this question several times in different conferences, honestly, but there is no comp So only thing that we can compare with is basically our own theoretical model because we do not have any other data so we want them to publish the the response we give them is why don't you publish your own data so that we can compare mm -hmm. yeah all right uh, so anyone else have any questions uh, in general or yeah i have a question yeah sure uh, thank you Thank you, Rabbi Bhai. It was an excellent presentation. I think yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. So I have a question about the imaging system, actually. Right. Uh, so I, I saw in the slide number eight, I guess. Right. 
So, yes. so you used uh, IR cameras and also a high speed camera. I think. Right. So to capture the uh, motion of the fluid, I mean the liquid, uh, how do you determine the parameters of the imaging, like the resolution, the pixel and the frame rate? I mean, how do you determine that? Yeah, um, glad that you like the presentation, Shorov. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, it's a valid question. Um, so the thing is, uh, there are two things that we needed to consider. First, how are we going to synchronize these two cameras? Because they have two different frame rates. The high-speed camera can go up to 1 million frames per second. But of course, we're not going to use that because to do that, we have to shrink down this, uh, the, uh, the size of the frame. Uh, but it's not really feasible. And the IR camera has 800 frames per second. So they, have, they are working in different frame rates. So we needed to use um, a, uh, we call it the, uh, the trigger, trigger circuit, like uh, we trigger a particular, uh, so we have a clock. Uh, so we trigger a particular signal. At that moment, both the cameras takes a shot. And uh, so we can always uh, create our own profiles, our own triggering profile. And that's how we can synchronize these two cameras. That one thing that we need to, needed to take into account. The second thing is, um, but uh, we figured out it's it's pretty easy. We uh, we actually need uh, uh, this synchronization. We have these built-in features. We can always run these two cameras in the same frame rate, right? That we can also do, because the high-speed camera use it because we have been using the Phantom uh, uh, Phantom program. So you can actually tune the frame rate and get the two cameras operating at the same uh, frame rate. Uh, for example, 800 frames per second. The second thing is uh, the heater size. So the heater size that we have is one centimeter by one centimeter. So uh, we shrank down, so we call it the windowing process in the IR camera. So the program that we used was Research IR Max software, but there is some lab view programs as well. So where, where you can basically shrink down the frame and um, you can actually get your one centimeter by one centimeter special frame. Uh, so once we once you figured out the special resolution because um, and the and the temporal resolution they're good to go, but one thing that we, you you need to keep in mind if you're willing to use IR camera, uh, you need to use another separate uh, thermometrology technique, for example, thermocouple to calibrate your IR camera for a particular pixel. If your pixel a single pixel is well calibrated, you can certainly assume that all the pixels are calibrated. So that's how powerful the IR camera are. That's why the military projects, they all are using FLIR cameras because it's really easier to calibrate with uh, conventional uh, uh, thermal diagnostic techniques. Um, is that, uh, did that answer to your question or do you have any other specific query? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, almost answered my question. So I have just one specific question. So uh, does the velocity of the pulsating fluid uh, have any effect on the uh, frame rate selection of the high speed camera? Um, not really. I mean, for example, um, yes, I mean, uh, in essence, of course, uh, right? Because, for example, uh, you are creating a pulsation. So each of the droplet coming in, they take one millisecond, right? Okay. For example, so you need to at least have hundred, a thousand frames per second. Uh, 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 of frame rate of the high speed camera, right? You can you do you you cannot really have any frame rate that is below that. So um, if you if you know the event, so that's very crucial. You need to know what event you're trying to image. Do you know the time scales associated with it? If they're that, you can convert it to a particular frame per second and make sure you have the camera operating at higher than that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Yeah, I think there's another just to add. Like there's uh, the thing that I forgot the, the frequency that you have to have like the twice the frequency. Yeah, Nyquist. the phenomena Nyquist yeah. frequency. That's yeah. probably there, considered. Yeah, I also had this question. Yeah, so <laughs> you have to maintain that as well. So because to capture a frequency in the image, so the maximum frequency should be yeah, so twice the sampling frequency like that. No, um, of, of the sampling frequency, yeah. Um, so here, I think it doesn't matter. I think, yeah. 
Actually, if you already if you already set it up like uh like higher frequency than that, I mean, then probably nobody would notice. Like it's just it's just yeah. I, I think yeah. Kind of we already mentioned like it should be yeah. higher than that. Yeah, if you want to capture. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Micro. Yeah, I think a uh, micro frequency is the way to go if you have like this kind of thing. So yeah, if we have any other question, uh, we'd like uh if you raise your hand and see. Yeah, also it's a very ex expensive setup, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's so many other group. I mean, we collaborated with two different groups to actually make it. Unfortunately, we have this setup in our lab so that we can run our own experiments. Uh, yes, the IR camera alone can cost you like 100K. Um, and the high speed camera we are using, the Phantom ones, they're also very expensive. Sometimes it can get up to 100K as well. And we all, uh, but of course we, we, these are not, those are not brand new. <laughs> so we, we, we bought some, just, I think you already, um, you all know that. So in the, because when we, when we first came in the lab back in 2017, my professor started work like in 2014. So he was here and for like three years. So he only had the seed funding and also the NSF career award. Um, but so that's all the money that he had at that point. But recently we have Recently, uh, we get like close to a million dollar funding from uh, uh, NSF with collaboration with Lockheed Martin uh, to investigate on pulsating sprays, not jets. So that would be super crucial as well because there's so many image processing pr uh, problem that we're that are raising. So if you have any particular expertise, the attendees that can benefit, like if you have any particular image processing uh, experience, I guess, we can actually use that in our labs uh, current research focus in uh, but there is there are some other aspects of it uh, right now we're also trying to if 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 anybody has any other questions uh, they can ask or i can always uh, i talk more i mean first uh, first thing first like Shorov is just getting started on image person so i mean he he, he that's why he's interested in all these things oh okay uh, yeah. <laughs> so i so think what, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 go on uh, so one one of the things like uh, most of our audience uh, uh, were probably living in Bangladesh at this point and uh, under restaurants. So these uh, he just brought up this like very expensive stuff. But uh, what do you think like the opportunities or if you have any advice or ideas the students should carry out? Probably the modeling part of it. Uh, right, it could right. be competition. It could be theoretical. Something that you have uh, we can throw in some ideas that they can they think about, read about, or something like this. That would be good yeah. for them. Take away. Yeah. So only thing that uh, that I it's it's a valid point. I was actually actually also thinking about that, but uh, it took me like several years to come up to this point so that we have experimental. So we know all the challenges involved, and there's so many scopes by just modeling the heater itself. Um, uh, we can always uh, we can always uh, do a lot of modeling stuff in all the commercial packages, uh, but. There's this thing that we also need to keep in mind. If we really need to solve this problem, solve these two phase systems, model these two phase systems, I am not really sure how much the commercial packages will be helpful in this regard. For example, ANSYS, COMSOL, Abacus, Star CCM, all the packages, they all tackle single phase, single phase problems. If you talk about open forms and even nanoscale molecular modeling, still there's this gap. So the gap is mainly because the, the complex, complexity of the flow patterns that we have in the two phase systems. For example, if you have a flow in a particular channel or if you have a jet coming in and taking the heat out from the surface, um, we can have annular flow, we can have bubbly flow, we can have dry spot appearing, we can have waiting phenomena at different locations. And those are really, really complex because there is no single evidence of theory. Still, people are the scientists from the fluid mechanics group in the Princeton, the uh, Dr. Howard Stone's group. They're still developing all the all the fundamental things, all the cool stuff at the solid liquid interfaces. So you can always imagine how much gap we still have in terms of physics. And once we know the physics, I'm sure the commercial packages uh, they will come up with good modules or two-phase two systems. Um, but we can always convert it to a single-phase problem, probably, and come up with a good proposal and tackle the, whether it can be implementable. Um, actually, I, I also have some other ideas about uh, pump-place cooling system, flexible cooling system. We are looking into these flexible cooling systems. 
that can be bendable, that has a major application in flexible electronics. Uh, we can always talk with our um, enthusiast uh, students at uh, BUET and also other institutes. We can always talk with them and I think uh, come up with the very simplest version, whether we can actually model that using open source or commercial platform, then I think we can move on from there. But I guess that would be a very good, we're open to collaboration. My PhD supervisor is always okay with that. But uh, yes, but we, we have to come up with a very good uh, proposal for that. Yeah, so I mean, I would say uh, for the people in the audience, it's a good opportunity for you to grab. Honestly, uh, if you like this presentation, if you are interested in this topic, probably you should email Chandravipai and have a chat to it. Like if you can do something, uh, even from Bangladesh, if, without having this very expensive multi-million multi -million setup. So uh, we are hiring one of the students in our lab from Howard Stone's lab. So we are hoping like we are gonna do some sort of cool stuff in the next couple of, of course. Uh, years. <laughs> so yeah, uh, uh, with that, I think if anybody doesn't have any question, uh, so we can probably wrap it up here. Uh, let's first thank you, our speaker, uh, before going away. And then we really appreciate that you're taking up time over the weekend uh, to come in and uh, give us this nice presentation. It's, and always, like, it's good to see you after a while. It's been two and a half years or three years I've seen you. Uh, just for the audience, that we have an announcement next month that we are going to have a um, uh, guest speaker coming from industry. Uh, he's a recent, like, not really, not really recent, like two years. Uh, it has been two years he graduated with a PhD from Case Western. Um, uh, we'll publish all the flyers and everything uh, very soon uh, with the Zoom link. Uh, there will be an interesting topic as well. He's going to probably discuss on bio, uh, biomechanical uh, aspect of uh, research and all these things, uh, which is a big thing at this point in the US. So uh, I would really appreciate if you guys join in uh, uh, and ask questions. Uh, if you guys be, uh, it would be really wonderful. We can ask this question always like to the speaker. We have we are well connected, but it's for you. It's more important to jump into the topic, ask the questions. Even if no question is silly, you learn. Like I mean, no question is silly. Don't don't worry about that. So yeah, next time uh, I think you'll be it will be more interactive. You guys jump in and then you guys ask questions and show your enthusiasm. And with that, uh, we can wrap up and we can uh, uh, let's again thank our speaker and we will see you next month. Thank you everyone for attending and also it's it's always a pleasure. Uh, Vivek, I mean, uh, it was a very good, I'd say, interactive discussion session because these are the questions that uh, we always keep on asking in different conferences as well. So it's really good that the, the attendees who are the current or former students at BUET, they're asking these uh, like really, really relevant questions. So that's really, really good thing that uh, the multi-scale mechanical modeling and research network there they're not only doing cool research in different areas, but also uh, trying to ask good questions and and you know uh, enhance their uh, and update their learning curve. So that's phenomenal. And I thank um, MMMRN for inv inviting me again, and uh, and all the board members and the yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you.